वेरी गुड जोया आप स्टार्ट करें होस्टिंग करें स्टार्ट करें ओके डन अस्सलाम वालेकुम एवरीवन फर्स्ट ऑफ आई गोना इंट्रोड्यूस द ऑर्गेनाइजेशन कि आप इस ऑर्गेनाइजेशन के थ्रू ये सेशन ले रहे हैं इस पूरे सेशन का क्रेडिट किस ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को जाता है द ऑर्गेनाइजेशन नेम इज फातिमा होपफुल पीस एंड साइकोलॉजिकल सेंटर ओके इसके फाउंडर और सीईओ हैं सर तैयब मुर्तजा और इसके बाद आपको भी थोड़ा बहुत अंदाजा होगा ये जो लोग सेशंस अटेंड कर रहे हैं कि हम डिफरेंट सेशंस करवाते हैं जस्ट कि हमारी यूथ को कोई फायदा हो हमारे ऐसे लोग जो इतना ज्यादा अफोर्ड नहीं कर सकते और उनको हम कम मनी के अंदर उनके कम स्पेंडिंग के साथ साथ उनको ज्यादा अच्छे से सेशंस दे सकें और आज का हमारा जो सेशन है इट इज अबाउट एन एल पी एन एल पी इज न्यूरो लिंग्विस्टिक प्रोग्रामिंग इसके अंदर आपको बताया जाएगा हाउ टू स्टडी द माइंड ऑफ द पीपल यू नो देर आर डिफरेंट एस्पेक्ट एंड आज हमारी जो होस्ट है जिन्होंने अपना बहुत बहुत खुशियस टाइम हमें दिया हर नेम इज मिस मारिया एंड शी गोना शेयर द स्लाइड एंड शी गोना इंट्रोड्यूस हर सेल्फ एज वेल She is a neurolinguistic programmer. She is a practitioner as well. So thank you so much for listening me. Now over to Miss Maria. All right. So thank you so much for that introduction, <laughs> and um, let me welcome everybody who made sure to be here this evening. Um, it is my ultimate pleasure to be here sharing this uh, knowledge with you. um i've prepared a quite packed session for you so i hope that like the last time uh, for those of you who attended the workshop on nlp you will be able to get away from the session with something of value to you that's the idea now if you were with me in the previous session you will also know that i value uh, interaction a lot so there will be a lot of questions and i hope uh, you can interact with me by um, replying in the comments and not only i brought a few surprises today that might involve a little bit more than just uh, replying in the comments but please do you know that i like to feel that i'm talking to people and not just waffling away so please uh do do uh interact with me along the way when i ask a question or when i request for some sort of feedback in the comments uh also i'm just going to ask you um so that i don't lose the, my train of thought to keep your mics off please at all times except if i ask anybody to uh, unmute and talk to me um if you can please keep the the mics off i would really really appreciate because uh, otherwise i'll i'll i might lose my train of thought not to say that i can't catch it up again <laughs> but if you can avoid that it would be seriously nice now let's move on good to the next slide just talk briefly about me so my name is maria extian and uh, i have a degree Uh, an initial degree in modern languages and literature um i studied in my home university coimbra who, who which is the city that holds the oldest university in my country portugal and i in the in the course of my degree i studied abroad so i studied in northern ireland um as an erasmus student uh, twice and um in the course of my career i ended up in south africa uh, teaching portuguese as a foreign language and once i got back home in 2009 uh, two years um, after that i actually had what i considered at that point a rather challenging uh, class at school and i realized that my students there was absolutely nothing wrong with their iq right what i could actually witness was that they had a lot of unprocessed emotions so they 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 or were overwhelmed with um and resourceful emotional states and so i found myself thinking and what do i do i i don't know how to deal with this um and so that's when my coaching quest started 
um, because I wanted to find the tools that would allow me to help them so that they can they could actually fulfill what I could see was a promising um, potential, but um, that was being hindered by their emotional imbalances. And as so often happens when we go into these fields of personal development, we think we're actually getting tools for other people, but we find ourselves uh, actually going through the journey and working on ourselves. And it's only natural that it, it is like that because as I usually say, when I speak about uh, leadership, which is also uh, um, a topic very close to my heart, when I talk about leadership, I always say leadership starts with you. So we have to be able to lead ourselves before we can actually be qualified to lead other people. And I think it kind of makes sense, don't you think? How can we lead other people if we can't lead ourselves? What are we leading other people based on? What are the principles that are guiding us? And as a coach, I feel that too. How can I be a good coach for other people if in some way I can't actually uh, come to the, 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 the play well sorted out myself? Okay, uh, aligned with myself from a empowered uh, position. So I really am one of those people that values congruency and therefore I love to walk my talk. It's not just me helping someone as a facilitator, which is very much what I am as a coach, a facilitator of a process, but I have to be able to have gone through the process and come out, you know, uh, shining on the other side myself. At least for me, that's how it makes sense. And so in the course of that quest for those tools, as I usually describe it, I ended up doing a lot of certifications, um, among which there's uh, the master NLP practitioner. So... And then also a post-graduation in coaching, which was actually the first post-graduation in coaching in this country and Portugal again. And then I also um, came across a beautiful tool called quantum healing, which is related to uh, NLP. It's a branch of NLP that takes NLP a step further and uh, which is for me the difference that makes the difference uh, in my coaching and the results that I get for my clients, my coaches. Um, also, I have a, a, a certification in, as a neuro language coach that has to do with uh, the teaching of languages, but it's a, 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 again, it's a, a, a methodology that bridges um, neuroscience research plus um, coaching principles. So that's been my journey. You can see me with Richard Bandler, one of the co-creators of NLP, um, with whom I did my master practitioner, and then also my late master, uh, Dick Harbors, with whom I was trained in quantum healing. So in this session, I'll do my best not to repeat myself too much, uh, bearing in mind uh, our previous session, okay? Uh, what we did together in the NLP uh, workshop. I still am going to talk a little bit of the meaning of NLP and the origins of it, talking about its principles and beliefs of excellence um, and how it, those inform the NLP practices. And then I'm going to talk about the NLP model of communication, which is actually quite, quite important for everything we do in NLP. So let's start with how the origins of NLP. And this is something that I can't change. The co-founders, <laughs> the co-founders, they didn't change from the last workshop to this one. It's still the same people. So we're still talking about Richard Bandler, with whom I trained, John Grinder, 
and Frank Pacelli, which is very often not mentioned, but he was also an important piece of the creation of this magnificent tool. So Richard Bandler um, has a background in many different things. Uh, he's probably what I would call a jack of all trades, um, meaning that he has many different um, degrees, actually. Uh, so he has degrees in maths, in computer science, in psychology and philosophy, if I'm not wrong. Among other things, he's also a musician. So he's definitely the, the, my idea of a jack of all trades. Uh, then we have John Grinder. Attention, there's a mic on. Please switch off the mic. Okay. Because okay, good. So then there's John Grinder, who is a linguist. Um, and finally, Frank Pacelli, who also has a degree in psychology and he is um, connected to uh, the Gestalt uh, movement. So at one point, it all started with, with Richard Bandler, actually. So Richard Bandler was house sitting for a psychologist. And while house sitting, he had access to all the wonderful books that that psychologist had on, in her bookcase. And he starts reading all those books. And what, what, the conclusion that he came to as he was reading all those books on psychology was that there were all these schools of psych psychology kind of uh, fighting each other for proving which one was the most prominent, the best. And what happened was that, as a matter of fact, he realized that a lot of um, the, the, those schools, as much as they wanted to claim um, prominence, they weren't necessarily getting a lot of results uh, effective results for the people that uh, they were working with, my, meaning their clients. So he started being really, really interested in understanding how is it that the people who have effective results, successful results, actually get those results? Well, what is it that they do that allow them to, um, to achieve those results? And what he also realized was by, you know, um, by means Maria? of... Yes? Can you open the caption? What do you mean by the caption? Uh, in this caption, uh, we read out the English in written form. What you speak, we read out in uh, written form. Oh, and where would I do that? Because I haven't got the slightest idea if I can do this here. In meeting setting. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But how do I get now there? Wait, wait, wait. Because right now, reactions, no. Share a video meeting info. I don't know if this is the case now. I oh, wait. It tells me that encryption is enabled. But what is disabled that I should be? Hmm. I honestly, am I speaking too fast? And now I can't, oops, I've done something wrong here, wait. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Now I have no, absolutely no idea. Just give me a second, please. Because for some reason, okay, this is back. I honestly don't know where to go now. Okay, no issue, you start without caption. I'm sorry, I, next time I'll make sure to, to, to have that beforehand, okay? Because I wasn't really prepared for that. And right now I have no idea where I could be going to actually get that. I'll make sure to get that for next time. So I'll, I'll do my best to go slow 
so that you can follow. Right, so uh, Richard wanted to understand what uh, was that was happening? What, what was that was allowing people to um, get psychologists who were getting successful results with their clients? What were they doing? And when he started talking to some people that he knew that were getting good results, namely people like Virginia Satir, the person for whom he was house sitting, uh, Milton Erickson, a well-known um, hypnotherapist, um, and even uh, Fitzpearls, very much related to Gestalt, he realized that they didn't know what was it that they were doing that were helping them get the results that they were getting. So um, what happened was that he invited um, John Grinder and later uh, Pacelli uh, to join him so that they could together look at these people in action, um, working with clients and see if they could spot the structure of what they were doing um, to realize what was it that they were doing that was uh, actually allowing them to get those wonderful results. And so it's the idea also came from Richard Bandler's background in computer science, where they were using um, something called modeling. Um, and um, that they, they can kind of transferred uh, modeling into this field so that they could understand or replicate these models of excellence. Once they had the structure, once they understood the structure of what these people were doing, that they were doing well and getting them th those wonderful results, that they could um, replicate it and check whether by replicating that formula, they would be able to get those results. So these were the three people that they modeled um, and that they uh, then gave the name of NLP. And as I've already mentioned, there are many different um, definitions of NLP. So it can be uh, described or it has been described by Richard Bandler himself, himself as a technology. Uh, which uh, is interesting because, yeah, if we think of his background as a computer scientist, um, he decided that NLP was a technology. He has also called it an educational tool that, which as an, educa as an educator myself, uh, I found fascinating. I really like this idea of NLP being an educational tool. And uh, it's also been called the art of, and science of excellence, which also makes sense in this, as that's exactly what NLP is all about, modeling excellence. And the study of the structure of subjectivity, which also makes sense if you think that in order to understand what were, was allowing those psychologists to have results, they had to help them understand what was it that they were doing that was actually getting them those results, right? And they didn't know what it was. They just did it naturally um, and uh, without really knowing what was it that they were doing that was allowing them to get those results. So they studied the subjectivity of that which they were doing so that they could then put it again into a structure, into a formula and replicate it with other people. So some people are one, one uh, practitioner, <laughs> trainer actually, NLP trainer, has this uh, definition that I really like of NLP, which is NLP is an attitude of wanton, wanton curiosity that uses strategies and techniques to consistently produce a desired outcome. 
And that's very much what we do, for example, in a coaching session, right? We go in as facilitators with wanton curiosity to understand what strategies are our clients using or not using, in which way they are using them so that we can help them revert whatever structure uh, of uh, subjectivity that they're using into a more resourceful um, structure, a more resourceful strategy. Because very often it's not like people can't do it, it's just that they're using the wrong formula in particular situations, okay? Which might be even a formula that works in other situations, uh, but it doesn't work in the one that, where they are applying it and not getting the results that they want, because that's the whole point, okay? So what exactly does neuro-linguistic programming mean? So neuro has to do with our neurology. In other words, the, it has to do with our nervous system. Linguistic has to do with language, verbal and nonverbal. And this is also very, very important. The importance of language and what, how language can help us work with people. It's actually fascinating once you know what you're looking for, what to look for, actually. And finally, programming has to do with our programming, the result of our conditioning, um, which creates patterns of behavior, of which some, as I've already mentioned, are not beneficial to us in certain situations. Okay, they can be beneficial in some situations, but they're not beneficial in other situations. In the situations where we're not getting the results that we want, those are the, 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 the circumstances in which we're using a strategy which is not beneficial to us, it's not useful, it's not uh, really successful. And those are the ones that we want to change. So NLP in the... 70s, because um, Richard Bandler started working on this idea of NLP around about the end of the 50s, uh, beginning of the 60s, into the 70s, and so on and so forth. So um, what he realized was that the, the, the mind and the body have a very intricate relationship. And there's no way we can think of mind and body as separate entities. And these two pictures that I put on this slide are meant to illustrate that. Because if you look at our nervous system, we have a brain which is connected to a spinal cord which in turn is connected to all the nerves in our body, which are connected to all the organs in our body. So how exactly can we think of physical and mental as separate? There's no such thing. Um, even if today there are certain people, and I've talked to certain people recently who cannot see the connection, my, if, look, if by looking at these pictures, we can't understand that there is a connection, I honestly, I'm going to be very honest, I will not be able to explain to someone how these two are connected. I think it's pretty, pretty obvious how mind and body are connected. And the interesting thing is very often in school, even from primary school, we have people learning about this, the nervous system. And yet it seems like at some point they forget what they learned when they learned the nervous system, which is the mind and the body are connected. Okay, the, the links are endless. So what this means in terms of NLP, it means that mind can influence body in the same way that body can influence mind. In other words, our neurology 
can influence our physiology in the same way that our physiology can influence our neurology. And if you don't believe me, let me demonstrate to you, okay? Now, this is one of those moments that actually I would love to see your faces if that's possible. So I don't know if you're willing and able <laughs> to show your face for a little bit, but if you can, it would be amazing. I would love that, okay? If some of you could um, switch on uh, your cameras. Okay. The cameras, not the mics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you can switch on the cameras, that would be beautiful. Exactly. I'm starting to see a couple of, of faces. I'm just going to ask you to uh, stay mute, please. But if I can see a couple of faces, it would be really, really nice. Okay. And I think once we go through the exercise, you'll understand that. Okay, you'll understand why it is that makes sense that you uh, will give me the pleasure of seeing your faces, okay? Um, so let, let's start by working. Let, let's start by, by me showing, uh, showing you how um, the, 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 body, the mind can influence, it, influence the body. And what I would like you to do is, is, if possible, is to think of something, of a situation, that makes you very, very happy, okay? A situation that makes you very, very happy and show me that happy face. Can you, can you please put a happy face by bringing up that? Very good, I can see a happy face. <laughs> very good. I can see a very happy face, okay? And if, Whoever is in the call, if you can see the same happy face, I myself, I'm doing a happy face because it's contagious. Okay, very good. And now, so as, you, as, you, as you can see, someone brought up a happy memory and that memory in our minds has a reflection on our face. Okay. So what I would now like you to, to do, if possible, if what I, what I now would like you to do, if possible, is to think just for a moment, a little bit detached, okay? You don't have to go to the moment, but if you, you know, in a detached position, can think of either a stressful situation, or a sad situation. Can you do that? Can you think of something that you may have stressed about this week, for example? Hmm. Very good. There we go. So I hope that you can see yourself or feel how your face has changed. Okay, even myself, I brought something which is stressful to me. You can see how my, if nothing else, my forehead is uh, reflecting that idea of stress. Okay, so there's nowhere a smile to be seen and I'm frowning my forehead, which is a sign of sometimes sadness, sometimes uh, stress. Sadness usually goes a step further. Very good. And now I would like you to think of a time where you felt extremely confident, okay? Think of a time. It doesn't matter how tiny that moment might have been, okay? But I would like you to think of a time where you felt extremely confident of an outcome, okay, of a situation. How does that confidence reflects in your body, okay? If I had to ask you, okay? If I had to ask you, because confidence usually comes not only with face, 
but actually with body posture, okay? Think of yourself being confident. Even if you're not standing, think of yourself being confident. How does confidence reflect in your body? What is your stance when you feel confident? Okay, can you share with me? Exactly, I've got quite a few faces here, good. So, okay, muscles are relaxed. That's, that's one for sure. What else? Yes, if you're confident, your, your muscles are relaxed. Very good. I've got a, a, <laughs> some sort of abstract painting <laughs> here. <laughs> okay. Uh, very often when, when you are in a confident position, you are standing up straight or sitting up straight. Okay. So usually your... Um, uh your back is straight okay your um shoulders are all the way not up but yeah they're leveled okay that's how usually we show up when we are confident okay when you achieve your goal very good that's one uh, way of of being uh confident is when we achieve one goal because Basically, what that is telling uh, telling us, um, yeah, please pay attention to the fact that what I'm asking you is to pay attention to your body language, okay? The body language, exactly, back is straight. Um, the body language of someone who is feeling confident, okay? So as you can see, your mind does influence your body okay your neurology does influence your physiology okay because if you're happy we've already seen what happens when we're happy to our faces not only but our faces you know show it very very well when we stress also uh, we can just by looking there's one thing which is called body language and i'm sure you are aware of and that's for example, in a coaching situation, that's one of the things that I have to pay attention to um, when I'm facilitating the session. I have to read my, my client's body language, okay? In many, many ways. Um, posture is one of them. Uh, and as we move along in, in our sessions throughout this course, you'll come across other situations where we're reading other things. So it implies a lot of, uh, attention and reading quite a few different um exactly as well very good someone someone said something which is extremely interesting here uh which is when we're happy we seem to be energetic exactly exactly and we'll get there in a moment but absolutely absolutely and that's another proof that our mind influences our physiology right? Because energy has to do with physiology, right? You feel it in your body. You feel that, that you can keep going, okay? As opposed to, for example, fe feeling stressed and feeling tired, right? So those things are connected, right? Good. Absolutely. Amazing. Very good. Now, um, <laughs> now there's, there's another... Um, No, no. Being quiet, there's a question here that I will answer, which is if someone likes to stay uh, quiet, does that mean that they are sad all the time? Absolutely not. We, we can be in relaxation mode. We can be in resting mode, which I would definitely recommend uh, every now and again. Um, so it doesn't mean that you are sad at all. You know, um, it just means that you are, listen, I may even going to say, say something else, which is something that I read recently. It's no big, big news, but still somehow it, it clicked, which is, it's very important that we have those quiet moments because very often it is in those quiet moments, not only that we process information, but also that we get our, get our most creative ideas, 
okay? So we need to allow our brain to relax, sometimes to have the best ideas. If you ask quite a few people, when do you have your best ideas? Some people are going to tell you in the shower, <laughs> for example, uh, which is in principle not a stressful moment, I, I, I would think, okay? Other times is when you're just sitting and just quietly and suddenly bling, a, a, a brilliant idea comes up. Okay, so those moments of relaxation um, are very, very important. Has, the, sadness and quietness don't necessarily uh, uh, are one and the same thing. Okay, right. So this is the second exercise that I want to. Um, to suggest to you, okay? Uh, and for this exercise, I'm going to ask you to stand, okay? If you don't stand, it doesn't work, okay? So whether you put the camera on or not is up to you. Uh, it would be nice for me to, to see how it's going so that I know that you are following my prompts, that you are following my instructions. But if you rather not uh, show uh, your face, I will absolutely uh, respect that, okay? But in any case, and I promise you, this is a very, very telling um, exercise, okay? And then I will be sort of dying. I see, I see that someone is raising his hand. Can I help you, sir? Is there a question in the air? If there is a question, feel free to unmute and ask the question. Or ask me the question in the, in the chat box, please, so that I can, I can, help you with whatever your query is. Ah, okay, oh, no, no problem. I thought I had seen, uh... okay, very good, I will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so let's do this. So I'm going to ask you to stand up from wherever you may be, just stand up from your chair or the bed that you're on or the sofa, please stand up. And as you stand up, I would like you to have room around you. So make sure that you have enough room to move, okay? Um, so that you don't bump against something, okay? But I need you to have some room around you. And I would like you to stand up with your feet shoulder length apart. Okay, Sh uh, your, your feet sh shoulder width apart. And um, keep, your, keep your body straight facing forward, okay? And I also want you to bring your arm up to the level of your shoulder, okay? Exactly. And I want you to point, if I can show it, point your finger, okay? Your finger should be pointing forward. And before you do what I am going to ask you to do, I just want you to remember, let's imagine that from your hips down, you are the trunk of a tree. It doesn't move. All you are going to move is the upper part of your body. So your hips are meant to be always facing forward, okay? Your legs also. And the only thing that you're going to move is your torso. And as you move your torso, you're going to move your arm and your finger, obviously, as well. So what I'm inviting you to do right now is to twist to your left, twist to your left as far as you can. Twist to your left side as far 
as you can. Just the upper part of your body, and I'll do my best to try and show you what I mean. Okay, let me see if I can show you. Okay, let me put myself in a position where I can show you. So here I am standing, facing forward. My arm is up and the finger is pointing forward. My hips are not meant to move. Let's pretend from my hip down, I'm a block of cement, but I'm going to twist as far as I can to the left. Okay, and as I twist as far as I can to the left, only my upper part, my torso, only my torso moves. As far as I can to the left, I'm going to ask you to check where your finger is pointing. Where is your finger pointing when you twist your torso to the left as much as you can? When you've already checked where your finger is pointing, I want you to come back to the original position. Okay, you can put your arms down, relax your body, okay? And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and imagine yourself, just imagine, imagine yourself doing that same twist and going further than you went the first time, okay? Close your eyes, imagine yourself twisting your torso, torso as you did just now with your arms stretched and your finger pointing forward. And as you stretch your torso, see yourself in your mind going further, okay? Open your eyes, arm up, finger pointing forward and twist your torso to the left and allow yourself to go as far as you can. And now look where your finger is pointing. Okay, now look where your finger is pointing. Did your, is your finger pointing at the same initial spot or is your finger uh, pointing even further. Only your torso moves. Your legs don't move. Nothing else moves. Only your torso moves. Now, I'm going to invite you again to come to the original positions, looking forward, arms down, relax your body again, okay? Close your eyes again and once again, imagine yourself twisting your torso with your arm stretch and your finger pointing forward and going even further that you went the second time, okay? So imagine in your mind that you're twisting your torso and this time, the third time, you're still going further than you went the first time. Very good. So now let's open our eyes, stretch our arm and our finger pointing forward and let's twist the, tor the torso as far as you can. Twist that torso as far as you can. Your hips are facing forward, but your torso and your arm are all the way back. Notice where your finger is pointing now. Ah, it's magic, they say. Very good, very good. Nice to know. Exactly. What happened there? I can see that some people are already telling me, oh, it's magic. It went further. Very good. I've got some wows. See, now you tell me, <laughs> you tell me that our mind doesn't influence our body. And if you were able to do this, okay, if you were able to do this just by closing your eyes, okay, 
Um, I'm sure you'll be able to see it in, in, in the recording, okay? I've got someone saying that missed the, this exercise because of the internet connection. Um, I hope you will be able to, to, to do it uh, when you've got access to the recording. And if I can bring it back, I will, okay? But for the time being, what I'm saying is, imagine this. It only took you closing your eyes for a brief moment and rehearse in your mind what you wanted your body to be able to do, okay? So imagine what you can do in your life if you do exactly the same in other circumstances. If you give your brain this exercise, okay, this practice, this drill, what would you be able to achieve by giving your brain this experience, this command, okay? You'll be giving your brain something to work towards, okay? Right now I can't repeat it, but if we've got time in the end, I'll repeat it, okay? Let me just, uh, make sure that I cover everything that is to cover. And if in the end there's time for that, I'll be sure to show you again, okay? I promise you that. If for some reason I can't make it today, and if you're back in our next session, please remind me and I'll be um, very good. I'll be uh, glad to um, take you through it. Very good. So you've already uh, helped me um, you've already shared with me uh, what the the what your experience was like. Okay, so this is what very much what. Well, if you remember what I mentioned in the previous uh, time that we were together in the workshop, if you were in the NLP workshop, when I talked about the placebo effect. This is exactly what the placebo effect is all about, is you set your mind for an outcome and that outcome happens, okay? In the case of the placebo effect, if you remember, I was talking about clinical trials where they, in one of the groups, they say, oh, here you have a pill and this pill will have this result. But as a matter of fact, they don't give them any, any pill per se, I know that there are lines on screen. I believe it was someone um, playing with the screen. So whoever did this abstract picture, if you could please get it away, because let me see if I can actually get it away. If I can, I will. Let me see. Can I? Yes, I can. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, someone was nice to give me a nice painting here, but we can, we want to be able to actually read the whole, the whole thing. So, thank you, Cedra. So as I was saying, so in, in a placebo, um, in clinical trials, there's always a placebo group, which is the control group actually. And that group is, is usually is, uh, told, okay, so you've got a pill here that is going to help you achieve this certain outcome, okay? And the, as a matter of fact, the pill has got nothing. It's a sugar pill, right? But a lot of people actually get the result just by believing that that pill is going to get them that effect, okay? So that is what I mentioned in terms of placebo effect in the workshop. And, um, and um, and um, that's very much what we were doing right now, okay? It's just that it's not connected with the pill, but it's still connected to, uh, uh, um, I wouldn't call it command. Um, uh, I wouldn't call it command, but it's, it's like these guidelines that you give your brain. Okay, and then when you do it, you're able to do it. Okay, so think about that because that's very, very powerful. And again, when you find yourself in face of a challenge, 
think very carefully of what is it that you want to train your brain for. But we'll talk about that in a moment as well. For now, let's see what were the beliefs of excellence that um, the founders of NLP came up with. And here uh, I'm using exactly the same as I used the last time. Uh, it's not all of them, but it's some of them. So um, we have a belief like if you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always got. And this belief of excellence, actually, I do believe it's very much related to Einstein uh, because Einstein was a huge defender of this idea. You cannot get different results by using the same train of thought that uh, didn't get you the results in the first place. So if you are going about doing something the same way and you're getting an unsuccessful result, well, change the strategy because if you keep doing the same thing, the chances are that you're not going to get the results that you want. So something has got to change, okay? So that you can get the result that you want. So there's something that you're not doing, which is not allowing you to get the, the result that you want, the outcome that you want. And then you have all the resources to do whatever you want. And I know that this one might seem like not really, but yes, really. And the reason why it's, um, the, the reason why it is a yes, really, it's, uh, I can give you an example that happened to me yesterday with someone that um, I'm working with and who says that has trouble focusing, okay? So he says he has trouble focusing. And yet he can spend hours playing a video game with friends and getting results. So what is he doing there if not focusing on getting a result that he wants? So does he have the resource focus? Yes, of course he does. But the question is, what's missing in the situation where he wants to focus, but he's not focusing? Get it? So he does have the resource focus. He's, the resource focus is not being used in the situation that he wants to use it because something is missing from that focus recipe. The something that will allow him to focus for hours for as long as he wants. Okay? So... Uh, that's what we mean by we, you have all the resources um, to do whatever you want. You do, because even the ones that you think you don't have, think where is it that you're actually applying them? You are applying them somewhere, okay? Maybe just not in the situation that you want to. And that's the part where understanding the subjectivity of what's happening is important. Okay, if someone can do it, so can you. And that is a fact. You know, as human beings, we come very much with the same human operating system. What might happen is that in some operating systems, there is a glitch. And so that's the glitch that needs to be uh, worked on, okay, because if other people can do it, I promise you that you can do it too. So what we would want to understand is where is the glitch, okay? It's like having a computer with the same operating system. And there's one here that is working very well and the one next to it is not really working that well. So the intervention on the one that is not working that well is actually finding the reason why it's not working like the other one, because they are the same computer with the same operating system. So it's not about the operating system. It's about 
the computer itself. Something in the computer itself is not necessarily working. Then there is no failure, only feedback. And this is one of those that I love for many reasons. Number one, because I myself at one point in my life was extremely scared of making a mistake, of failing on uh, doing something until I understood that um, not getting the result that you want is not necessarily failure. On the contrary, it's actually learning. And if you look at it from that perspective, you can ask yourself, so what can I do differently to get the result that I want? Okay, so this one and the first one at the end of the day, you know, they are all connected, but I think that it's quite obvious in which way this one and the first one are very much um, two parts of the same coin, uh, so to speak. So that, that is my invitation to you, okay? If something doesn't go the way you would like it to go, ask yourself, what can I do differently to get the result that I want, okay? And then if you try, you won't succeed. Now, this is also a very good one. And I do believe that we did an exercise in our previous uh, session in the workshop where I showed you what this means, okay? Are, are people here still remember? Does anyone still remember the exercise? Exactly, it was the door one, very good, that's it. So what I asked, what I suggested, and I'm going to do it very quickly now, not going to take the same time that we took the last time, uh, but the exercise consisted of you imagining yourself opening a door, and then you imagining yourself trying to open a door and comparing the pictures that come to your mind. You opening a door and you trying to opening a door. And this is the first moment or the first exercise in which you can see how language also has an effect on you, okay? On the way you feel, uh, on your mind and your physiology. Because if you say try, you're coming from um okay i have someone raising a hand so is there a question you can either drop the question in the comments or you can un unmute yourself and ask me the question directly it's up to you i don't mind either or okay please ask the so, question uh, yes so wonderful uh, uh, session going on best of luck i have to leave for the another meeting Thank you, and Alafis. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. And I hope you'll be able to see the second half um, on the recording if you um, have the chance to get hold of the recording. Very good. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, so th this is a, a way of understanding to or to start understa understanding how um, our language also influence our results. Because when we see even if it is subconsciously, because that's what happening. The exercise is meant to make you aware of what happens when you use the word try. And it's not the only one. There's many other words that can have a detrimental effect on your mind and then your physiology as well, or the other way around, okay? Because I don't know how many of you are, um, familiar with the work of um, a Japanese scientist that I can't remember the name of now, but I'll make sure to bring it in our next session. Um, I don't know if it is Emamoto Maru or something along those lines, but I'll check and I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, but he conducted experiments it's not related to, to Reiki, but, you know, everything that works with energies is very much, um, you know, touch points. Uh, there's a lot of um, commonalities. But uh, he, he actually conducted an experiment with water. 
and he would put water into different jars and then he would put uh, different words on the jar like love hate and then you would uh, freeze it and then you would take a little bit of the the ice and you would put it you would uh, put it under the microscope and see what flakes appeared and the ones with beautiful words like love peace friendship were beautiful 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 um beautiful 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 um flakes and when the water had had um, words like uh, for example um, hate war etc um, the, the 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 flakes were completely different and didn't look the amazing thing that they look now if we think that we are 80 percent water Okay, we are made up of 80% water. Imagine what words can do to you, okay? On a mind and body level, okay? Very good. So we'll extend a little bit on that when we start looking at, uh, exactly, um, molecular shapes changes as well. Yes, most definitely. Okay, and all of this is very important when we're working with people. Why do they have the conditions that they have? Why do they feel the way they feel? Okay, there's not one cause. There can mean many different causes. Uh, okay, so someone asked me what you think that, what is the difference between self <clears throat> Sorry. Hypnosis, hypnosis is to a certain extent part of NLP, okay? It's one of the tools that NLP works with. Now, you can, we, we can use with hypnosis, uh, which is a deep trance state, or you can work with uh, lighter trance states. But one of the tools of NLP is definitely uh, hypnosis, so much so that uh, um, Erickson, Milton Erickson, was a, a hypnotherapist. So that was from the get going part of it. Self-hypnosis, you know, it's hypnosis in any case. Um, so we can look at that as we move along as well. I mean, there's a, there's a part of one of the sessions where we are going to talk about the Ericksonian model or Mil Milton model, uh, which has very much to do with hypnotic language, okay? Which I use a lot in the branch of NLP that I work with, which is quantum healing. Uh, we use a lot of Milton, um, of the Milton model, the Mil Milton uh, or Erexonian language. Whole behavior as a positive intention, it's another um, very interesting um, belief of excellence. Um, and um, it's often one that people also have trouble wrapping their heads around. Uh, but it is a fact. When someone, when someone, for example, what can I say? When, when, when we have, when we're triggered by something, let's say that we're triggered by something and we go into an anger state, okay? Uh, where we can't control necessarily our emotions um, and we just become angry and shout at someone or something like that. Believe it or not, I mean, I, this can be approached in many different ways. And again, there will be a session where we will be looking mostly at uh, emotions and how to work with emotions. And this one is definitely going to come up. Um, mm, uh, so what I was going to say is, there's more than one way to look at this situation with the, the, the question of anger. But the, the, the important thing, the anger is the behavior, right? But there is a positive intention behind it, even if the positive intention is actually defend yourself because you felt threatened in some way, okay? 
Um, um, so um, behind every behavior, there's a positive intention. And then the person with the most flexibility controls the system. I mean, as I said, I think the last time, even Darwin said that. Everybody thinks of Darwin because of the the survival of the fittest, but he actually is known to have said as well, and as far as I know, it's part of his work as well, um, the origin of the species um, or the evolution of the species, um, where he says that in the future, the people with the most, the, the people who are the most adaptable to the circumstances will actually be the ones who will, um, survive if not even thrive uh, and that is a fact the if we bear what we've been going through uh, in mind for the last two years uh, probably the people were able to adapt the best to uh, the uncertainty and the amount of changes that were introduced without um as expecting them and in a very uh, fast way, those people who were able to adapt were probably the ones that felt the most balanced, okay? And finally, map is not territory. And this is also one that I love to bits, which is every single one of us has got a map as a consequence, and we'll look at this in a, in a few minutes when I talk about the NLP uh, communication model. Um, every single one of us has his own very specific map of the world, so to speak, which is based on our experiences and even on cultural aspects like, like our language and our culture. And so my map and your map, looking at one specific thing, my map and your map may actually be extremely different, but it doesn't have to come with culture and language. Two people who speak the same language and uh, were born into the same culture might have different maps regarding the same thing. Sorry, because their experiences, their live experiences, their upbringing um, gave them different maps. So, and that, it, that can even happen sometimes when we're using uh, uh, Google Maps, right? Um, where the map doesn't really correspond to the territory. And we end up in places that we didn't want to find ourselves because somehow the map did not correspond to the territory, okay? So this is another one of these. And one of the things that I will invite you to do, not now, but one of the things that I will invite you to do if you have uh, also access to the, the, um, the slides uh, is put these beliefs of excellence into an order, okay? Which is the order from the most useful to you to the least useful, okay? So you can even think of a certain situation that you might be facing and ask yourself, which of these beliefs of, uh, beliefs of excellence could I use that would help me um, actually be able to achieve the outcome that I want, okay? So that's an invitation uh, that I leave which is, um, can you elaborate on that one uh, a bit? Uh, 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 <laughs> All right, so uh, elaborate on, on the map a little bit. Let's do the following. When we get to the communication um, model, NLP communication model, I'll develop a little bit more. Okay, um, because then it's also very much appropriated and you probably will be able to understand it better. Okay, okay, very good. Right, so that's very much, here we go, actually, we're, we're already here. Okay, so the idea is, okay, so the NLP communication model, how does it work? So, 
this is how it works. Let's see if I can uh, be clear. Um, if I can't do it the first time, I'll attempt a second time. <laughs> attempt a second time until I, I actually get it right. So, when we look here at external events, okay, this means that outside us there's a lot of stimuli. Now we are bombarded with stimuli, two million bits of information every second okay now imagine that if you if you can two million bits of information every second and this information on the outside world comes through to us in terms of different senses our five senses okay so through visual stimuli auditory stimuli, kinesthetic, which has to do with, you know, um, touch um, and not only. So um, physical stimuli, which can be external or internal. So it can be external, for example, if I still feel the wind, okay, that's an external um, kinesthetic stimuli. If I'm feeling anxious, that is an internal uh, kinesthetic stimuli or stimulus. It depends uh, whether there's a, 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 a set of them or a group of, of things working together or one single thing. But anyway, so, and then there's also smell and taste. Okay, so those are the five sen senses through which we make sense of the world. But because there's so much information uh, thrown at us every, every second, and our brain can only grasp between five and nine focus. So in average, in average, it can be anything from five to nine. So in average, we can only deal with seven um stimuli in one go so what happens to everything else so what happens to all the information so we take it in we absorb it if you want by using different strategies we use filters okay and those filters can be Something that I've already mentioned, not in these words, which has to do with our values, our beliefs, our decisions, our memories. So this has to be to do with um, <clears throat> our programming, our conditioning, be it social, cultural, or personal, okay? Our upbringing, our education, okay? So, and also, in order to be able to somehow making sense of it, we, will, we have to use the lesions, distortions, and generalizations. So meaning that we take some information, but we erase part of it, we kind of distort it, and we generalize it so that it's easier for us to assess it. When we talk about in one of our um, in one of our um, coming sessions we'll also be talking about this in more detail what does this deletion distortion and generalization mean when we talk about a different model from the Milton model which is the meta model okay so there's the Milton model and the metal model within NLP so by then I will, I will uh, go into what each one of these things means in more detail. For now, let's just say that besides our conditioning, there's that uh, um, strategies, those strategies that we use in terms of deleting, distorting and generalizing some things that come our way. And again, so we, that's where we come from. Now, to explain the map 
as the okay, as this goes in, as we absorb this, right? This forms a picture. And that is the map. These filters are the map that we are using to make sense of whatever, whatever information is coming our way. Okay. So different people. This is very well known, for example, it is well known that many different people that witness an accident are probably going to give different accounts of what they experienced, what they witnessed, because each one of these people are coming from their own map. Okay, so these filters, their own filters that go with their conditioning, in terms of social, social, cultural, and personal uh, upbringing, okay? And then also uh, their own set of deletions, distortions, and generalizations, because not everybody does the same deletions, distortions, and generalizations, okay? So that's what the map means. If you think, how do we learn, okay? We learn every time that we learn something new, there is the possibility that a memory will be formed. And when all those memories are formed, we have our own neural map, okay? Meaning that all our neural pathways are connected in a certain way based on the experiences that we have, okay? So, uh, my map and your map of the world is not necessarily the same. So when I'm working with someone, I cannot come from this idea that what I did with person A is going to uh, um, be useful or successful, effective with person B, because they may have different maps. And therefore, what I need to work with is actually their territories, okay? The territory meaning the way that they perceive the world, okay? And the way that person A and person B perceive the world may be very different for the reasons that uh, I've already mentioned, okay? The fact that when we when we absorb information, we're absorbing them through these filters that we have created um, growing up. Being that the first seven years of our lives are the most important because after the age of seven, so up until the age of seven, we have no filter filters. That's why usually people talk about children as sponges because they absorb very much everything without filters. They, they're learning from the way that things make them feel, uh, basically. And then after seven, it's when the filters fall into place and we start interpreting very much everything based on those filters that we created through the first seven years of our lives, okay? Those first seven years are that important. Not to say that there are not other experiences, but in those, those, uh, those experiences after seven, much of them are going to be filtered through those filters that we created through the first seven years. There's always the, the possibility of that other filters may come into place and we can all, always change our filters. That is what NLP is supposed to do, okay? Which is um, allow our map to be expanded, to see more choices, more possibilities than the ones that we are seeing. And that's for some reason, are keeping us stuck because we're coming from that map. So we need to expand the map so that we can see more possibilities and more, more choices. And therefore, uh, with an enriched map, we'll probably be able to get a lot more done. We will probably be able to find solutions to 
a lot more challenges. We will probably feel a lot more fulfilled and we will probably feel a lot happier because we're getting the outcomes that we do want to get, okay? So just think of a situation where you thought you weren't able to do something and then you did it. How did that feel? And we all for sure have at least one experience where that happened. I'm sure there are a lot more, but go with one, one situation, one thing that you couldn't do, and then you managed to do it. And how did that make you feel when you finally managed to do whatever it was that you set yourself to do, okay? That's very much what, uh, what uh, I'm talking about. So um, we take the information in, we filter it, and then the output is going to be based on that as well. So very often we go into this loop, okay? Of having information coming in, we filter it through our filters and then we throw it out, output it in based on those filters as well. Okay, so, and that is why sometimes you have two people talking about one thing and they have completely different, they're coming from completely different points of view. Don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that. I have many, many times been in a situation where I'm talking about the same thing with another person and we are coming from totally different perspectives, okay, because that person has his or her filters, and I have got mine, okay? So that's very much the, understanding this, it's a good starting point to understand that I have to meet the other person in his or her territory. That's how important this is. And it's also very important to understand how we sometimes find ourselves in certain states okay, either physically or mentally, uh, emotionally as well, okay, and let me see if I can give you an example of this, so I don't know how many of you maybe have some phobias, okay, it could be spiders, it could be snakes, it could be um, mice, or it could be something else, okay, Ah, so I do have a phobia, okay? And my phobia is about mice. It's just the way it is. I got it somewhere, um, but it's a fact. So what does that have to do with the NLP communication model? It has to do because, because of my phobia, I have been in situations where I didn't see any mouse, but because of a noise or something, um, I thought there was a mouse, okay? So I can tell you the story that, what, that one day I was going to um, a shopping center that is across from um, my mom's house. And at that point, um, there was a field in front of the house. And if I went through the field, I would get to the shopping center a lot faster rather than going around. Um, I, if I went through, uh, through the field, it would be faster. And as I was going into the field with a friend, there were like bushes on the left side and the, 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 the right side of the path. And I heard some rattling in the bushes. And immediately I jumped and I said, I'm not going that way. And my friend was going like, oh, don't be silly. Come on, let's go. And I said, no, I'm not going. In my mind, that noise I associated with a mouse. Do you think I managed to go through that field? No, I didn't. And I have to be honest. <laughs> I went all the way around. I couldn't care less if it took me longer. I was not going to go through that field. So that was my filter. My filter was that filter of an experience that I had had in the past where that noise was associated with, with the mouse. Was there any mouse in there? Not that I didn't see any. So there could have been, there couldn't have been, but to my mind, there was, okay? And so this is very important be because it created 
uh, th this filter, um, yes, we can get over phobias. Uh, with this filter, we, we, or rather in my case, with this filter, I got into a state of um, panic. There's no other, there's no other, other word for it. I panicked to the point that my, my, I, I, I had tears in my eyes. I was on the verge of crying. God knows, I mean, you know, from a logical point of view, goodness. But from an emotional point of view, you know, the brain can't really distinguish between what's true and what's imagined. And this is a fact, okay? The brain cannot distinguish between what's real and what's imaginary. So, um, so what I created in my mind, the way I filtered the information, which in this case was mostly auditor, uh, auditory, but not only, but the way I filtered it sent me into a panic. Okay, and that's not a resourceful state. And that meant that I had to go around. And that meant that I was going to take more time and so on and so forth. And then, you know, it, in this case, I was just going to the shopping center, but imagine a different situation where my filter sees things in a way that is a lot that, uh, more detrimental to my life. Okay, so the phobia, I think, is a, 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 an a easy way of understanding, but it's not necessarily um, the only thing. There are many other things um, about this. So what I would like to do now is actually show you mm, to, see, to see if I can make this a little bit clearer. Um, I would like to show you two videos, one at a time, and then we'll, I'll ask you for some feedback um, about of each one of them. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Ah, oh, sorry, my mistake. Um, okay, let me ask you, and then and then I'll I'll play it again because uh, I can do it in this in this way anyway. So three passes, really? <laughs> How many passes did they do? So Cedra says three. Anybody else? Whoa, someone else says thirteen. Woof. How many? Let's see if anyone can give me the right answer. Eight, okay. Any more? Three, quite a lot. <laughs> ah, someone knows the secret. Very good, very good. Yes, yes, yes. Hold your peace <laughs> for a second. Very good, he knows the secret. Okay, so some people say three, other people say 13, and other people say eight. Okay, now, <laughs> I know that secret as well. Oh, <laughs> very good. Okay, so I can tell you that it's actually 15, okay? There's 15 passes made by the team in white. Now, my question to you is, how many of you saw the gorilla? It's 15, 15 times. How many of you saw the gorilla? There's two people who saw the gorilla. Okay. <laughs> very good. Yeah, so some people, very good. Okay, good, good, good. Now, a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people don't see it because they're so focused counting the passes, right? That they miss the gorilla altogether. So exactly, it has to do with, well, you call it attention, I call it focus, okay? So, and what, how, how exactly is this relevant to our lives? Can someone tell me? Why, why is that relevant? 
Why did I bring this, this uh, uh, video? Even if so many people apparently were able to, to spot the gorilla, but by spotting the gorilla, I've got a feeling that you, you weren't necessarily, <laughs> that's why I couldn't count very good exactly, but see, it's the same thing. There we go. So usually people are so caught up counting the passes that they don't see the gorilla because you apparently maybe knew that there was a gorilla, you couldn't count the, the, the passes, right? So at the end of the day, you got the same result because you put your focus into something. And then what happened? When you put your focus into something, very often what happens? Tell me. Oh, you didn't. Okay. But you spot, the, does that mean that you spotted the gorilla? You didn't know that the gorilla existed. You spotted the gorilla, but you, you uh, lost track of the passes. Is that it? Very good. Okay, well done. Okay, so what's the point? Exactly. Ah, beautiful. Okay, so the answer is here and I'm going to read it. Sometimes we start focusing on little things and forgot about the main. And sometimes we are at the stage of life where we can't focus on one thing. Very good. Okay, so basically that's what it means. When we have a challenge, which most people call problems, but I don't call problems, I call challenges because if it's got a solution, it's not a problem, it's a challenge, right? So that's the way I like looking at it. But when we have a problem, let's go with problem. When we have a problem, what very often keeps us stuck is our focus, okay? We focus on something which is not allowing us to see the big picture, okay? Or it can also be that we're so caught up in the big picture that we, we, we failing to see details that could be the difference that makes the difference. Does this make sense? That's why we needed to be able to expand our, our map, okay? Because the more we expand it, the more possibilities, the more choices we will see, the more solutions we will see to a problem or challenge, whatever you want to, to call it. Does that make sense? So that means expanding our map beyond the filters which are keeping us um, back, okay? Does this make sense? Can you see the point? Exactly, absolutely, also right. Okay, very good. And someone got a cl a clarity on, on the map situation. Very good, that's it. You see, very often our map only allows us to see either the passes or the gorilla, right? But both things happen at the same time, okay? So sometimes it's, how to get angry. exactly, but it's also also being aware of our focuses, where we focusing on, okay? And this is very much what I want to show you in our next video. Yes, 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 Sorry, yes, exactly this one, okay? Um, where the I'm I, this this idea is developed even further. So let's have a, a check here. <laughs>
Okay, so is that clear now? <laughs> Can you see where this is going? So because of those filters, because of our focus, okay, there's something in our brain. Yes, yes, it can be scary, but what if, what if you can change your, your, your focus, okay? What if now that you are aware of what, how the brain works, right? And that this is the way it works. What if you can choose to, to um, change your, your focus? You can uh, uh, set your RAS to look for something else, okay? And actually, I'm not using this expression, what if, just randomly, because that's exactly what I would advise you to do. There's more than one way to work with it, but one of the ways is what if, okay? If you think of something, like, I don't know, an outcome that you want to achieve and you decide, oh, but this is difficult, okay? But ask yourself, what if? What if it's possible? What if it was easy? And I'm actually going to give you an example that I'm not kidding, okay? I told you I like to walk my talk. So I can give you an example of my own experience where that happened, okay? With a little help of a friend, that's a fact. <laughs> but... Uh, it's a fact. So what, 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 roughly a year ago, roughly, it was a little bit over a year ago, it was November 2000, oh my God, I'm lost, 2020, I think, uh, November 2020, I was told by my landlady that I had to leave the house that I was in because she was going to sell the house. And up until then, uh, every time that I have moved house, and I have moved house so many times in my life <laughs> that I lost track, but every time that I've moved house here in the region that I'm living in my own home country now, uh, every time that I had to move house, um, 
what happened was that it would take me roughly six months to find a, to find a new house. And so the, the landlady tells me, okay, we're going to sell the house, we need to move. And immediately to my mind comes, oh my God, this is so difficult to find a house six months. Fortunately, okay, fortunately, I was going through one of the, the QH, quantum healing uh, trainings. And I can't remember exactly what we were working on on that specific session, but my trainer caught what I was saying. This idea that, that oh, it's so difficult to find a house here. It takes me six, every time it takes me six months. So what he did is he helped me reset my RAS to a different focus, a different point of view, in which we installed this idea that it was easy to find a house. Do you want to know how long it took me to find a, a house to move into? Is that something that you are interested in knowing? Mm, there are some very interesting questions here. Yes. Okay. So it took me two days, believe it or not. Okay. It took me two days to find a house to move into. And at the end of, of the week, I had already made my decision. I had already told my, my landlady that bye-bye, I found the house. So I'm moving uh, at the end of the month. And so this is how powerful this is. And this is how possible this is, okay? Now, when someone asks me here, uh, and there's been more than one question, I'm taking notes so that I can address things at the end, which is, but what if people continuously label you? I get you, I honestly get you, you know? Um, yeah, that's a deep uh, belief, uh, uh, what I call a, a disempowering belief, but even those can be worked on, okay? Uh, it's possible. And again, you're talking to a person that has changed a lot of those herself. So I do exactly know where you're coming from. Um, there are many ways in which things can change. I'll give you an example, okay? Um, now, recently actually talking to one of you, I was asking whether you were aware of a personality trait which is called highly sensitive pe person, okay? This is a psychological trait, well studied by an American psychologist. Um, and I'm not going into it because I promised that that will be one of my next workshops, not in the context of the NLP course, but one of the, the weekly workshops will be on highly sensitive people. Now, I am a highly sensitive person, so I, I, I fit the, the bill, so to speak, so I fit the mold of a highly sensitive uh, person, although there isn't really a mold because within the, the highly sensitive um, person trait, um, personality trait, there are many beautiful nuances, many dif uh, dif different people. However, there's also a common structure to uh, the, the, the trait. And so not up until, not, not so long ago, not so long ago, I still thought, I still had this belief that I was a slow learner. OK, because I would see so many people just studying quickly and they could grasp everything. And I had to read once, twice, three times <laughs> to actually get it. And I thought to myself, my God, I'm so slow. And then I found out that I'm a highly sensitive person and that highly sensitive people, because they process information so deep, they also take longer to actually be able to process that information, to make sense of it, okay? So suddenly I realized just by becoming aware of a personality trait that I wasn't aware of, that I wasn't slow, I was deep. Now, how beautiful is this, okay? How beautiful is this? You're not slow, you're deep. And if you know what that depth means in terms of 
everything that comes with it. Yes, it comes with its challenges, but it's also a beautiful trait to be part of. Okay, so see, this is one of the ways is knowledge, knowledge is power. The moment I became aware that there was such a thing as a highly sensitive person, and that's how they process, uh, process information. My God, it was so liberating. I didn't have to be slow anymore. I was suddenly deep and I was in love with my depth. <laughs> okay, so I wasn't in love with my being slow, but I became, you know, in love with my depth. Um, so that's one thing. And then there are other ways of, of overcoming um, deep ingrained uh, disempowering beliefs. Okay, does that make sense? Um, yes, absolutely. Someone, someone knows what I'm talking about here. Yes, very good. Um, absolutely, that's it. So th that is that. We can change focus. I changed my focus with knowledge, with awareness, but there are other ways of actually going in and uh, help people change the, the programming. Okay, go from disempowering state of belief to an empowering state of belief. And that's exactly what I want to share with you. Okay, how can we change states? Okay, this is a question that I actually saw asked quite, quite often. I saw many questions, but this is a question that I saw being asked very, very uh, often with... Um, in, in one of the workshops that I attended, it, I, I wasn't facilitating the workshop, but I, I actually paid attention to the questions. And uh, this is, what I have here are very much management um, ways, managing tools to change states, okay? So one of them is when you are feeling overwhelmed, close your eyes, no sound. I'm not talking about meditation at this point. Just close your eyes and allow your eyes to do what they're supposed to do when they're closed, which is processing information. Sit for five minutes, sit for 20 minutes. And when you come out of that period, check how you're feeling. Okay, the chances are that you're feeling a lot less overwhelmed. Okay, so this is one. The other one is breathe. We very often are not aware because it's, a, it's a, an automatic process how we're breathing. Okay, so breathe deeply. Um, it can also be, oh my God, there's something so beautiful here. I'll, I'll come back to that. So, but breathe, breathe deeply and I want to take you through a, a, an exercise at the end which is in a few minutes uh, where uh, I'll teach you how to breathe to get out of stress and and fear and panic and so on and so forth then meditate I'll come back to this one meditation is extremely important it's been proven scientifically that uh, when you meditate for uh, exactly when you meditate for for eight weeks uh, in a row the amygdala which is a device that we have in our um, brain and which is responsible for uh, our fight or flight reaction sh shrinks Okay, so this has been scientifically proven. Eight weeks of meditation and your amygdala shrinks, which means that you tend to react a lot less and you'll feel a lot less stressed, a lot less fearful. Okay, so journal. It's so important to put on paper what's going through your mind, what's how you're feeling, okay? And always remember to bring an aspect of gratitude because you cannot, and this is also scientifically proven, you cannot be in a state of gratitude and fear at the same time. And stress is fear, believe it or not. We will address that as well in, a, in an upcoming session. Okay, so journal, put on paper what's going through your mind, how you're feeling and express some gratitude. Find things to be grateful for. It doesn't matter how small they can be. Um, 
just go, go into the feeling of gratitude. Then talk to a friend if you can, because very often when we're speaking out loud, for some reason, things click, okay? The worst is to stay stuck in our minds, okay? Stay stuck in the mucky mind. Find someone to talk to, okay? Um, and you'll see that as you start speaking out loud, uh, a lot of things fall into place. And if you can't find someone to speak to, speak to yourself in the third person. Like, for example, Maria is feeling overwhelmed. Oh, Maria, come on, why are you feeling overwhelmed? Well, Maria is feeling overwhelmed. You're detaching yourself from the situation and you're changing perspectives. And by changing perspectives, you can look at things from a different perspective. OK, so it, it and it helps you. The detachment uh, situation helps a lot with finding solutions to AKA problems uh, in my language challenges. OK, so do that. Go for a walk in nature. OK, people tend to spend too much time inside. Nature is our natural environment. Go out, breathe fresh air, go into a place where there are trees, take your shoes off, put your feet, bare feet on grass, on, on ground, on soil, whatever. Allow the energy of, of, the, 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 of nature to uh, get in, in close contact with you. This is also scientifically proven. And for those of you who are interested, I would um, recommend uh, this, um, that you watch uh, the documentary called Herthing, okay? So watch Herthing, which I'm writing in the comments, okay? It's, the docu it's a documentary. You can find it, if I'm not wrong, you can find it on YouTube, okay? Just watch Herding, if you want to know how important our contact with nature is. Run, remember that our emotions are energy in motion. And when we are stuck, it means that our emo emotions, the energy of our emotions are for some reason stuck. So move, okay, move, because as you move, you're allowing that energy to be processed to an extent. Okay, not to mention the fact that when you run, when you walk, when you, uh, when you dance, um, you are um, actually producing certain neurochemicals that are going to help you uh, process certain things. And very often also get you out of the state that you're in. So dancing, I would ask you, find yourself. I'm sure every single, every single one of you has got an uplifting song that every time that you hear it, you just, your mood lifts. Do that. Put that, put that music on, put that song on and dance to its tune or at the very least just, you know, sing from the top of your lungs, you'll find that your, uh, uh, that your, your state and resourceful state changes. The next one, believe it or not, it's also very effective, which is getting a pen and putting it like this, okay? <laughs> as you're studying, as you're doing whatever, just do this. Why? Because when you do this, you're activating in your face the same muscles that we activate when you smile. So remember someone told me, fake it until you make it. That's actually what you're doing. You're sending the brain the signal, I'm smiling, even if you're not, but I'm smiling. So the brain is going to produce exactly the chemicals that it produces when you are in fact smiling. So that's it. And finally, laugh laugh as much as you can, watch comedies, because it'll bring all the, exactly, more dopamine, exactly, that's exactly what it is. So all of these are extremely effective 
management tools for unresourceful states. Okay, I just want you to, to, to bear that in mind. Yes, the best, the best is always uh, even better than dopamine. Although dopamine, obviously, there's two sides to dopamine, but dopamine can be very um, um, good for us. Beneficial for us, serotonin, most definitely, oxytocin, okay, which is the one that we get from being with friends, with people who understand us, that listen to us, that we can relate to, and also endorphins, which is, for example, what happens when you go for a run or you dance. So endorphins are our natural opioids, okay? When you, when you hurt yourself, your brain immediately releases the chemicals that are endorphins that go to your uh, to your whatever your is hurting to help you deal with the pain. Now I'm going to finish. I know that that we we have come to the end of our time, but I'm going to finish very much by just leaving you with this idea. The thing is that we release endorphins when we are in physical pain but we release absolutely no endorphins when we are in emotional pain. And that's why we can so very often overcome physical pain in an easier way than we can overcome emotional pain. But if you know that some of these activities actually help you release endorphins, that's your way of producing the chemical that is going to help you uplift you, okay? And I hope like, I said at the beginning that you're going away with something of value from this session today. There would be more things that I would have loved to do with you, but I mean, I think coming to this point is actually a very good point to come. I also did my best to answer some of your comments and questions as we went along. There's only one question here that I made note and that I haven't tackled. Sorry, which is someone who asks, sometimes we don't accept things that are compulsory to us and why? To answer this question, I, I can answer this question in, in different ways, but I would have to, I would need a little bit more of context, okay? What exactly are these things? Can I have a specific example for, uh, um, um, so that I can address the question in the best way possible. Without knowing the context, uh, I would. Th there are two things that immediately come to my mind, which is, um, number one, there's probably either a value or a, a value of yours, something which is important for you, um, uh, which can be, for example, freedom or... Uh, independence that you feel that is being um, not is not being respected. Uh, so and therefore uh, there's resistance there because it's going against one of your uh, values. The other thing that immediately comes to mind is that one of the five human um, one of the five drivers of human behavior is autonomy. And if you're told to do something without being included in the, the, in the decision process, you're not going to want to do anything whatsoever because for you, autonomy is, a, is your main, let's say it's your main um, driver of human behavior and therefore, um, it's not being met because you're not being made part of the decision. That's two things that come to mind. But again, I would have to, I would need to know exactly what we mean by what things are compulsory to us that we are not, because it can be something different. These are the two things that immediately come to my mind. Um, but we could be talking about something completely different. So I would have, I would need a little bit more, um, context to, to give you a, a better answer. <laughs> thank you so very much. You're so good. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I really, really love being here with you, sharing what I'm passionate about. And 
again, if you can take any value from this session today, um, of course, that is very rewarding for me. Uh, and I'll be looking forward for the next sessions, um, uh, which are going to be equally um, informative. Um, so in many different ways. So I hope to see you soon. Don't know if there are any more questions. I really don't want to uh, go overboard. Um, so thank you so much. I'll do my best to... Um, to next time um, be able to have um, captions. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so let me see the great layer. M management tools for anxiety or when in stress. The, all of these, all of these, all, all of these, all of, all of these lists that I have here are management tools for stress. So please use them, okay? Please use them. Um, there we go. All of these are, then there are other things that we can do, but all of these, all of these things which are here in this list are actually um, um, useful. Uh, and the more you do them, the, the, the easier they become and the more effective they become as well. Okay. And you are creating a new map uh, in your brain by bringing these things. The amygdala shrinks, the neural pathways become different when you move, when you run, when you dance. Um, so all of these, all of these are man management tools for stress. However, and all of them are free of charge. You can do everything for free. So it's actually very, very good, I would say. So, uh, in what I do, I don't just address management. For me, there's always a resolution. When we talk about emotions, I'll tell you what I mean by management versus res resolution, which is what we should be looking for. We should be looking for resolution. We should be looking for resolution, not just management. Management is a great first step, but beyond management, there's resolution. And that's what we should be looking for because that's what can bring us to a, a, a state of empowerment. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, my darlings, I, um, no, my mom is not fine, but thank you for your prayers. Um, yeah. Um, actually, since you brought that up and it's been brought up, previously what i can tell you is without going into much detail um not because i don't want to but uh, because i want to stay in a resourceful state the truth of the matter is that at any time i might ac actually to ask for a, a future session to be to be cancelled okay um because that's the situation that i need so yeah, that's it. So, and so that I, I don't, <laughs> well, uh, my mom is actually, my mom has got um, colon cancer and it's terminal. So that's what's happening. All right. So uh, at any point I can be called to go home. Okay. And I won't be able to, to be here in a session, but yeah. That's life. We come in and we go out. It's part of the journey that we signed up for, believe it or not. <laughs> so, so that's it. So, so that I leave you in a good note because I really, really don't want to leave you in this note. Let's have some music. And if you feel like it, move it. Can you hear it? Wait, wait, wait. I wanted to give you a little bit of music, but then in the meantime, uh, I did I wasn't sure that you could hear. So let's see if I can again just share and we can just say goodbye until next week with uh, this. Can you could you hear? Just give me a yes if you could hear the, the music. Ah, okay, good. 
because I, I wasn't sure. So let's go. I'll play the music for you. Make sure to dance as, as if there is no tomorrow. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it. I like to move it. And if you want, turn on your camera. Let me see you. I like to move it, I like to very good so let's summarize the <laughs> very good let's uh, summarize the session then we have to go so please do summarize the session feel free and then we can finish on this beautiful note of move it move it <laughs> So see, see how, how it changes state. <laughs> it changes, it's infallible. Let's go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope my voice is clear. Yep. Okay. So I was the host of this session and now summarizing the session. What we have learned is uh, how our mind is linked with our body. That means how our neurology and psychology is linked with our physiology. And Ma'am Maria has explained each and everything very well that how uh, our body is linked with our mind, our postures, our body language shows that how confident we are and how when we are smiling, how impacts, uh, how was it impacts on our mind, each and everything. She has explained very well. But the uh, thing, how why we are summarizing the session is that there was the problems of internet. So, and there were a lot of, the students who have joined just now. So for them, we are summarizing the session. And after that, we have learned that how to do yoga just to enhance your body language, your body skills, and your mental health. Because yoga is quite, 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 you can say that important for your body and for your mental peace as well. And for those who are in stress, who are in, uh, you know, they're unable to focus on one thing, there are so many activities. One of them is done by Ma'am Maria as well. So it was all about today's session. I hope you enjoyed. And one more thing I would like to add here is, um, it is not for, uh, you know, for one day. It is not only one day class. The sessions and the yogas Ma'am Maria has told us, you must do every day. If you want to see change in your body and your mind, if you want to see change in your cognitive abilities, so you must to do uh, these activities uh, on daily basis. So hope you enjoyed the session. Meet you uh, on the next session, inshallah. Uh, now over to Ma'am Maria. Thank you, Ma'am Maria, that you joined us and you give your precious time to us and you really, really guided us very well. Thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. Thank you so much for coming. And please move it, move it. I hope that from this week to next week, you just move it, move it like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> okay, and so stay well, stay happy, stay uplifted. And see you next week. Bye. <laughs> Bye, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>